Well, greetings to you. This is Alan and Liana Platt greeting you uh, here from a very special area uh, in the Brooklyn campus that we affectionately speak of as the Hooksal. It really just is a little room in the corner of the administrative building and we had very special experiences here that have ignited the trajectory of our last 25 years. So this is where it all started. And when we look back on our humble beginnings, we are deeply grateful and thankful towards God who has graced us as the Doxa Dio family to steward this dream. We're going to tell you the story and it's going to be my privilege to engage you, taking you on this journey that we together with so many others in the Doxadeo family have enjoyed. So uh, brace yourself uh, as I then excuse Liana and I will be telling you this story of our journey of Doxadeo. God bless. Well, it's a joy to share with you the journey of Doxadeo. Uh, it actually all started in 1992, uh, where Liana and I had the privilege of taking leadership of uh, the church here in Brooklyn. At that stage, uh, it was called Corpus Christi. And... Uh, uh, the church had gone through crisis, uh, so much so that this beautiful building that can seat probably more than a thousand people only had 360 people that were identified as being part of the church. And uh, when we took leadership, we really recognized we needed God uh, because we'd never led our own church before. And in the divine providence of God, we were invited to take that responsibility. And in a very short space of time, we saw the miraculous happen. Uh, God just started adding people to the church. And so in a space of two years, another 1,300 people officially joined the church. So you can imagine uh, there was momentum. We were having incredible fun just experiencing the presence of God and the growth of the church and the restoration that was taking place. And so two years into that journey, I'm sitting in my study preparing for a leadership meeting that evening. And I thought I'd just read the Bible and just clear my head as I started to prepare and as I read the scriptures, it, the, the Bible fell open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the, the portion of scripture that speaks about the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, as I was reading it, I just sensed the presence of God in my study in a very, very special way. And I, I was reading, and you know, sometimes you read the Bible and you recognize now you're really reading the Bible. Or the Bible's reading you. And I was reading the Bible and, and, and read this one phrase that says, to some are given the gift of faith. As I read that, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me in my spirit saying, do you remember when you started out here two years ago, very few people believed this church would rise up again and become an instrument within this community of grace and goodness of God? But you believed it. By that time, tears were streaming down my cheeks, and I, I was just speaking to the Lord, saying, yes, Lord, it's true, I believed it. Well, it was in that moment that I heard God say to me, that was not your faith, it was a gift of faith. I have to admit, it was the first time in my life that I had become aware that I had been functioning under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to believe beyond my natural capacity to believe. Well, as I was pondering this and considering you know, what that meant, 
God dropped something into my heart that has changed my life and affected the trajectory of this ministry in a very vital way. I distinctly heard God say to me, I give you faith to trust me for a city. I don't know how to explain it, except to say that in that moment, I became impregnated with this conviction that a geographical space the size of a city can come under the dominant influence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Well, I, I was a mess uh, because I was having this experience with God, and the only things that I could write down on my notes for that evening on this pad that I had was faith for a church, faith for a city. And armed with that, I came to the leadership meeting that evening. Now, I knew that these were seasoned leaders, and, and I couldn't just barge in and tell them all about, you know, the fact that God had spoken to me about the city. And the last thing that they actually needed at that stage was some young pastor that now had a vision to take over the city. And so as we gathered, I, I turned to Rick Moser and said, Rick, just lead us into worship. And as we entered into a time of worship, the same experience that I had in my study suddenly filled this room, this very room, and and the people that were here were all just experiencing a very similar engagement with God. So we spent some time just enjoying the presence of God. And when it became quiet, uh, one of our elders stood up, Francois Rotenbach, and he started speaking in tongues. And when he finished, I did something that I'd never done before. I turned to him and said, Francois, whatever's in your spirit, speak that. That is God's word for us. And Francois spoke in Afrikaans, but translated, he said the following. God says, I'm giving you the city. Well, I mean, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because you have to remember, up to that stage, we'd never spoken city. We'd spoken church. Restoring the church, building the church, establishing a healthy church. But suddenly... The introduction of the focus towards the city. And one by one, the leaders were confirming that this is what God is saying. God is turning our attention to the city. And so as we deliberated that night as to what this could mean for us, that was after I just picked up my notes and said, guys, I don't know what to say to you, but this is all I have to say Faith for a church, faith for a city. We recognized God had spoken. And two things came to mind that very evening. The first thing was we realized God was not saying that the city would come and join the church. So by implication, we knew God was challenging us as a church to position ourselves to engage the city. And then we realized the second thing. We don't know what that means. We don't know where to start. We don't know how to engage it. And so we made a commitment that we won't just rush out and do stuff in the city, but for the next season, we're going to give time. Every time we gather, every time we come together, we're going to pray and deliberate, asking God for understanding, for wisdom, and for strategy. Understanding, understanding this whole concept of the church engaging the city and, and what that means. Then for wisdom, in terms of how do we take small steps and how do we bring everybody that is journeying with us on board in this journey? But we wanted clarity in terms of strategy, knowing this is how we will engage. And so literally, for the next two years, we did not do much except to consider and ponder and, and allow God to speak to us. 
which we believe God did in that two-year period. And so after the two years, when we felt we kind of had an idea of possible strategy, uh, we decided to relaunch the church and called the church Doxa Deo, literally the glory of God, which really was the fusion of two languages because we also believed that God was going to use us to bring different peoples together. Greek is doxa for glory, Deo is Latin for God, fused this together in our name and the logo became a wave because we were challenged by the scripture in Habakkuk 2 verse 14 that says the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the ducks of Deo, will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Hence the wave in our logo, the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God. In those two years, God spoke to us in various ways. But it was the portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 6 that was speaking of Jesus feeding the 5,000 that really got our attention. And in that portion of Scripture, there are various principles that have become guiding lights as we've navigated this journey. And I want to share a few of those principles with you because they are the important moments in our journey and our history. It, of course, all starts with the difference between the disciples and Jesus in terms of their mentality. So the first thing we realized is we need to shift the way we were thinking. It was clear that the disciples were thinking different to Jesus when they were feeding the 5,000. Because, you see, the disciples saw the problem and they were immediately concerned. But they immediately also became aware of their lack of resources, saying, what difference can we make? And somehow we identified as a church with the disciples. We saw so many things that we were concerned about, but we felt, what difference can we make? But when they get to Jesus, the Bible says he had compassion. And Jesus says, we're going to give them something to eat. You see, compassion gets engaged. Concern wants to send the people away, hoping that somewhere, someone else is going to take care of it. And so we started asking the question, what is the distance for us between concern to compassion? How do we shift our thinking so that we can start to think the way Jesus was thinking? We recognized, first of all, that there is a theological shift that needs to take place. Because you see, I grew up thinking we have no role to play in the world. I thought the idea of Christianity was get people as far away from the world as possible. Then I discovered in Scripture that Jesus prays just before he dies. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. But as you've sent me into the world, I send them into the world. You see, we that are not of the world need to be in the world. And we started discovering so many scriptures that were challenging us to the greater agenda, God engaging his world. But also, philosophically, we had to shift. We had to shift in the way we were thinking about church and realize that church needed to become a missional community. That people were not just coming to the program, but people were the program. And so that started the whole process of us thinking about how do we raise city changes? How do we develop people to know God, love people, and impact their world? This was all part of the changing of our mentality. But then we also recognized Jesus had a strategy. Now, fascinatingly, Jesus says to his disciples, go break up this group into groups of fifties and hundreds. Uh, Jesus was very intentional. 
Because Jesus wanted to feed the 5,000 and somehow breaking them into smaller groups, I think would have made it easier to monitor and to navigate that whole practical process. Uh, God started speaking to us about our strategy. And that's where we got our multi-campus strategy to think about smaller groups all across the city, but them forming one church, one miracle, many groups. And so if you are part of a campus or you're engaging Doxadeo, you will see that we have multi-site, but integrated into one process of mission that we share together. And uh, of course, when they had uh, taken the bread and the fish, it's interesting, Jesus uh, doesn't break the bread and the fish and build a whole reserve so that they can feel really secure. You know, at least now reserve matches need. No, he breaks the bread and the fish and puts it into their hands and then says to them, go feed the people. Now, I can just feel the tension of that moment because, I, I mean, the disciples standing there with these small pieces of fish and bread realizing this doesn't make sense. But as they go, Starting to break the bread, small pieces, they recognize the miracle in their hands. And this was one of the principles that we were challenged with. Instead of going out and trying to do something really big, just start to break the pieces. Just start to engage the different dimensions of our community and society. And we've seen over the years the things that we have started as small initiatives that have grown so large. And we are reminded of the principle that Jesus taught. He said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, but it grows to become a big tree. But one of the areas that we were deeply challenged with was going to the other side. Jesus says to his disciples, after the, the fact that they have uh, ministered uh, to the people and, and they gather all the leftovers, Jesus says to them, go over to the other side. They didn't really want to go over to the other side because the other side was the heathen side. It was the pig-eating side. It was the unclean side. If a good Jew went to the other side, when he came back, he had to go through a whole cleansing ceremony if he had any contact with that side. And God started speaking to us as a church, saying, don't isolate yourself. Don't position against your community. Integrate within the context of your community and start to equip and train and mobilize and send your people into the other side. Because as they engage the other side, I will be with them. And many of you know that story that on the other side, Jesus once again broke the bread and fed 4,000 people on the other side. You see, this side, that side, it's all his side. And we started to realize that the church is the equipping place for us to be able to engage our world, our community, our city. But another principle that we were deeply challenged with was the fact that they picked up 12 baskets full of what was left over. In other words, that which they were blessed with in the miracle now became that which they would export to other places because they took those baskets somewhere. And we were challenged to start thinking, how can we bless communities, other environments? And how can we take what God has blessed us with to other cities? And some of you know that our journey has been the, the 12 city vision. It's now become the global city vision because as we've started to engage with others and blessing them with what God has blessed us, we've seen the emergence of what we now call the city changes movement. 
And the City Changes movement initially was just a platform that we created for dialogue with leaders outside of Doxideo. Well, that has grown into a full-fledged program where leaders are signing up and doing learning community programs for nine months and being facilitated to think missionally. That which we are doing in Doxideo, we're now helping churches all over the world. As a matter of fact, right now in 22 nations, we have an influence on leaders helping and encouraging them to lead their church to become more missional. And we're so grateful that as we have continued on this journey, uh, we've seen the grace of God. Uh, it, it was about five years ago that we sensed God was challenging us to even trust Him for more in terms of our own journey. And we announced the Accelerate season. And we've just seen an acceleration of planting of campuses, engaging in society, in the different spheres of society, with, with some of the activities that we have, have seen God's grace upon, the skills training program of pop-up, the orphanages, the schools, and so many of the other activities right across the world just escalating. Right now, we're in an interesting season of COVID, but it's in the season that we've sensed God give us grace. And somehow we've been able to reinvent, rethink some of our engagement, both locally within the church, as well as within the context of us ministering to leaders all across the world. And so we're seeing this metamorphosis, this, this transformation taking place. And our encouragement to you is to recognize that the church is God's agency. It's not just a place where we come together to come and listen to a sermon and sing a few songs. It's where we are empowered to be on mission. Let me end with this thought. When Jesus says, I will build my church, he does not say, I will build the temple, which was the logical spiritual reference of his day. He doesn't say that I will build the synagogue, which was the place where people gathered to process religious and spiritual understanding. He says, I will build my ecclesia. The ecclesia was actually a concept that the Romans engaged with. The Romans sent an ecclesia. This was a small group of people that were upstanding Romans that when Rome conquered a region, they would send them into that region to go and orientate that region to the way of Rome. That the people there would talk like Romans, walk like Romans, act like Romans, so that Rome's influence would become evident in that environment. We are the Ecclesia. Jesus said he'll build his Ecclesia, which is a small group of upstanding Christ followers that are sent into this world to go and orientate our world to the way of the King, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, so that people will come into the kingdom way of doing things. May God bless you. As you consider just some of the journey and some of the thoughts of the process of Doxideo, and remember, we're still on the journey. And as we journey, we will document what God is speaking and saying and investing in our hearts. God bless you, grace to you, and thank you for listening.